this morning together. I just want to read to you from Psalm 145. This is verse 9 to 19 from the Message Version. It says, God is good to one and all. Everything He does is suffused with grace. Creation and creatures applaud you, God. Your holy people bless you. They talk about the glories of your rule. They exclaim over your splendor, letting the world know of your power for good, the lavish splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is a kingdom eternal. You never get voted out of office. God always does what He says, and He is gracious in everything He does. God gives a hand to those down on their luck, gives a fresh start to those ready to quit. All eyes are on you, expectant. You give them their meals on time. Generous to a fault, you lavish your favour on all creatures. Everything God does is right. The trademark on all His works is love. God's there, listening for all who pray. For all who pray and mean it, He does what's best for those who fear Him. Hears them call out and saves them. We've been travelling through this series, Blessed. We've been reminded countless times of God's love, His grace and mercy our undeserved gifts, these promises of hope that we can cling to when times of our lives feel like we're just tumb- they're tumbling around us. When our hope is only Jesus, we fix our eyes on the real prize, a tangible relationship of love that travels with us through all the paths of life. We are a blessed people this morning. I hope you can join with us in worship.
you that you are Lord of all, that you are in all, that you are through all, that you are here beside us, you are here right here in the service with us this morning. Holy Spirit, may we know your presence with us today. We thank you that you change us, that you grow us, that you shape us. We thank you that it's just a cry you need from us and you are right here. We praise you, we bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to NBC Today. My name is Nicola. I'm the associate pastor here. And we are aware that we have a number of visitors with us who are here. We've got a special farewell and thank you for uh, Alistair for his years of serving in CAP. So if you are here for that this morning, we really do welcome you. Um, And if you are here for the first time, uh, we extend a warm welcome to you as well. We've got a little welcome pack that we'd like to give to you. It's got some information about us as a church. It's got a free coffee card in there. So if you are here for the first time, if you just give us a big wave, we've got some helpers who will come and bring some welcome packs round. So any, anyone here for the first time? Oh, we've got one over there. Anyone else? Don't be shy. And then over on this side as well. If, if you just put your hand up for her, then we can get it. <laughs> there we go. Well, it is good. It's good to gather again together. Um, uh, a couple of things. Firstly, thank you so much to all of those who um, feed back about Night Church through the survey and who came along to our forum last Sunday night. It was great to see so many people there who um, are really invested and care about our church and what we do. Um, from that... It seems really clear that Night Church is about connecting, connecting with God through worship and teaching and connecting with each other. And that uh, there's this desire that it doesn't just be a replica of what we do in the morning, but it's an opportunity to do something quite different. Um, And so our next step now is we're bringing together a team of people who are going to commit to Night Church to carry the vision and to make it happen. Um, And so we're going to meet together next Sunday night. If you are interested in joining that team or finding out more about what that would involve, please come and chat to me. Tonight we will gather for worship and communion at 7 o'clock, so you are welcome to come and join us. Now you may have noticed that we're playing the fun game, kind of like Where's Wally, but it's Where's the Offering Box? Um, we're, we're trying to get away from passing the bags around just for some good hygiene practices during this season in the world. And so the offering box will always be up the front during the service. Um, when you arrive at, oh, there we go. Thank you, my beautiful assistant here. Um, so, so when you arrive, it might be up the front, it might be at the back, just come in, have a look around. Feel free to bring your offering before the service. During the service, you're welcome to put it in or immediately afterwards before Nikki whisks it away and puts it in the safe. Um, Or we also really uh, welcome if you'd like to uh, give via automatic payments. We really appreciate that as well. We thank you for supporting uh, the work of the church that we're able to then um, share the love of Jesus with people uh, in our community and wider than that. It is now time for the kids to head out to their program. So uh, Kids Rock, Little Rock, Boulder. And while the kids do that, please turn and greet your neighbour. Let's gather back. Well, kia ora, church family. Ni hao. How are you all doing this morning? No one's doing very well. How are you doing? Good? Good. How are you enjoying level one? Nice to be getting back to normal again. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Uh, We're doing much better than Australia, aren't we? Yes. I heard things are not so good in uh, in Melbourne, in Victoria. So uh, we're so blessed here in New Zealand, aren't we, as we shared last Sunday. Well, as Nicholas said uh, a few moments ago, this morning is a special mo- uh, morning as we celebrate uh, our CAP ministry, but particularly celebrate uh, two wonderful people who have been at the kind of the core of our CAP ministry for uh, really since it began. 
Alistair and Bronwyn, and uh, we want to acknowledge you both this morning and celebrate with you in, the, in your, all your years of service uh, with us, and we've got some people to share this morning. But before we do that, yeah, I think, I think they're worthy of a clap, but we'll have another one after this as well. Um, but before we do that, uh, first of all, I also want to say welcome to Ben uh, Mai, who's here as part of CAP. Ben's the Network uh, Partnerships Director, and I know there's some other CAP Head Office staff. Who, who else here from CAP Head Office? Or all of you guys down the back. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to Ben as well. Before I ask Reg to come up and share, uh, watch the screen, because some of us might not know exactly what CAP does, Christians Against Poverty. And so this is a wonderful story that we're going to hear this morning of a couple, a family, that have been impacted greatly by the ministry of CAP. Home was a place of shame, of disappointment, of hurt. For me, uh, home was a place of isolation, facades. I'm just going through the motions, but I wasn't happy. I don't want to come home. I would be quite stressed out dealing with the debts and the anger that I held. The kids would avoid me. One of my daughters, she would actually like hide away from me because uh, she didn't know what to expect. When you know that your children are living in fear, you feel like you failed. We found ourselves being isolated um, from our whānau. Um, we would avoid family gatherings because we felt like we had nothing to contribute. Once we started with CAP, it was like instant relief. And through the whole journey of three years, it was the constant care. Mm -hmm. God cares about our finances. He cares about our family. He cares about our marriage. And that was the biggest thing when we came into Christians Against Poverty. God cares about all things. He wants to be involved with everything, even budgeting. The choices that we can make as parents now is that we can, you know, we can spend time without that cloud of, of um, Debt and we have space to court it all, we have space to sing, we have space to mm. actually enjoy, enjoy each other. And there's more understanding of there's something bigger for us out there. Faith is at university, she's doing really well, she's thriving. Never in our wildest dreams that we thought that any, any of our kids could reach that milestone. She is the first mokopono of um, about 60 grandchildren. We see the transformational change that has happened firsthand, breaking that generational cycle of poverty mindset, of just taking what is given and not excelling or exceeding what she believes or has seen in her own vano. And because she's the firstborn and just that, that proud father, you know, that she's reached that place that I've never been, that my wife's never been or even our families. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a proud moment. There's a deep responsibility, not only to our whānau, but a, a deep responsibility to give back because of what we have received, um, the help that we have received. It's been life-changing, it's been transformational, it's been truly a, a blessing um, to our whānau. God has definitely called us to people, and I guess with the opportunity to be a cap debt coach, it's having that opportunity to go into the homes, to connect with people in our communities. I get to help with the mahi at, at Cap Head Office and caseworking is my life because I get to love clients to the finish line. We get to love them to that debt-free finish line and nobody is exempt. Nobody can't achieve that because we have. I have worth and I'm a, a loving wife now. I'm a loving mum. For me, home now is a place of happiness, community, I want to come home, I'm excited to come home. Home is a place of peace now, a place of joy now, a place of dad's dry jokes and a place of, of safety. Home is where my heart is, my family. And I, uh, Trish has told me that uh, Kath and Marlo are here this morning. Is that right? Yeah. Kia ora. Good to have you here today. 
Isn't that a wonderful story uh, of, of, of a family who, who was uh, unable to get out of debt? And look at how uh, God has impacted their lives. And, and that's the story of CAP, and that's the story that Alistair and Bronwyn have been part of for the last 10 plus years. Reg is going to come up and, and uh, share a few words, and then Ben will speak after him. Good morning. This is how it happened. It didn't start with Alistair. It started with Morris. Morris got hold of my arm and twisted up my back one day, and he said, you should hear what's come to New Zealand. We at, it was called then Baptist Savings, now called Christian Savings, said, he said, we at Bap uh, Christian, uh, Christian Savings, sorry, wrong way around, we have bankrolled this group from CAP. Who are they? And he explained it to me. And I thought, this is great. Because we have this little trust at Northcote called the Christian Trust, which gives money to people who need a handout. And we give them interest-free loans. And we realise that we can't do the whole depth of thing that we want to do. And so, just to give a bit of advertising to that, this year we'll probably reach $800,000 worth of loans that we've given to people. Now, you don't know about that because they're all confidential. But that's pretty good. And Morris said, these new people have the same objectives. And we want to get in with them. And my arm was twisted up my back. Meantime, Alistair, you're also at Christian Savings. And you started working on me. And you told me one day, the man who wrote this book, Nevertheless, which is free if you haven't got your copy yet, Trish, you hold stock them? Yes. He's talking at Milford Baptist. Get over there. So I went there, and at the end of the service, I talked to him, and he was coming over here to see us by 2 p.m. 2 the next day. So it's the same day. But he had to cancel that because his mind just said, you've actually got a full program. So a month or so later, a whole bunch of us went out to um, CAP headquarters, and we interviewed them. And they told us that they've been investigated thoroughly by Morris. And never has anyone in their history investigated them so thoroughly. <laughs> and he came and said, their systems are great. So Alistair came, and then we started talking big time. I didn't know Alistair before that. He's outward looking, he's progressive, and he's also very dogged. And he came along to our conversations and it brought into our friendship these two books. The first one, as I mentioned, is Nevertheless. Okay, the second book he brought along was When Helping Hurts. It's a vital book. Because if you charge in helping someone, you'll get it wrong. This one gives, so it's actually a negative title, When Helping Hurts. <laughs> but um, it's how to do it better. And we found that Cap was there. Meantime, I had bought, got two books from a course called Love Your Neighbour. And these are mind-bending books. One is called God Space, which a lot of you know. And Caroline Stretton holds the church resources on that. And one was, another one was the outward-looking outward church. Instead of saying to people, come to church, we go into their community with our comfortable. And that's the difference. So Alistair said, I know who's there. And I, told, and I told him who was there, and he says, yes, he's on the cap board. So we were brought into that. And, and then, um, so I needed to do some homework and find out where the church would fit. So I went down to the, the National Baptist Community Conference in Wellington. and found out how they organise trusts and how the church needs to be isolated, not isolated, be different than the trust for, for security reasons and all sorts of reasons, for fin financial reasons. So we got a community trust. And I suppose the rest is history. 
Alistair was at work, and, was, and there was, and uh, the previous um, cap manager had to resign, and so Alistair decided to come into this. And um, he has done an excellent job. He's brilliant to go out with. When you go out on a trip with Alistair, he's got his bags, he's got his laptop and all his cap stuff, pens and paper and stuff he's got to do. But when Alistair goes to someone's place, it's different. He hobbles in on his broken legs and is immediately talking to people with broken lives. And they just relate. It's beautiful. And very quickly, you become friends. People know that you're on their side. And they open up their innermost secrets. And they ask for help. It's a wonderful process. So, Alistair, here are the words from your annual report of 2011. <laughs> By the end of 2011, he said, I am totally convinced in the practice of linking social concern with a clear commitment to evangelism. Having visited 37 new families in the past year, only one has refused prayer. And almost everyone appreciated the testimony of those who came out with me. I'm also convinced there's nothing special in our approach or attitude that results in God's touching some of our clients with his unfailing love but the simple act of putting ourselves in the hand of God and then putting ourselves out there with people who are hurting and encouraging them to come to Jesus. Now, Alistair, you've handed over responsi responsibility to Trish. And I've been out with a couple of client visits with Trish. And I can assure you that Trish is just as good as you were. <laughs> and so, Cap... Northcote is in very good hands. And now that you've retired, you don't have to manage them, but you don't forget them. Well said, Reg, and uh, thank you, Bruce. As Bruce said, my name is Ben Mai. I'm the Network Partnerships Director at CAP. Uh, kia ora, uh, ni hao, good morning. Really good to be with you. And um, I recently, very recently, returned from a couple of weeks leave, actually, just on Monday. And, you know, you come back after a couple of weeks away and you open up your computer and you've got a very full inbox. And you're like, oh, man, where do you start? Where do you start? And I'll tell you, there was one that caught my eye that said, this Sunday, there was a celebration service at Northcote for Alistair, for Bronwyn. And I was like, wow, that's where I start because that is where I want to be on Sunday morning celebrating with you guys and with you guys as a church. So it's a real delight uh, to be here this morning. Thank you, Trish, for the opportunity. I think by the end of the day, Trish had said I'd uh, had, was it 30 minutes to speak or have I kind of added a zero in there somewhere, Trish? <laughs> we'll see how we go. Hey, um, Alistair and Bronwyn, uh, thank you so much for all that you've brought as a couple. I should really stick to my notes because you guys as a couple are a couple that I have huge respect and admiration for. And I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you for your service for so many years here at Northcote Baptist. I want to say, Alistair, congratulations to you. As you know, you are the first uh, CAP church-based worker in New Zealand uh, to serve for 10 years in the CAP ministry. Should we give him a clap for that? <laughs> awesome. So good. And as you know, Alistair, you are part of a very exclusive club. Uh, if we look across the wider cap Fano, uh, you and one other have served for 10 years. Uh, that one other happens to be my wife, Amy, um, who is um, uh, gutted she can't be here today. She's down in Gisborne uh, celebrating five years of partnership with the CAP Partner Church down there at Mangapapa. But um, Alistair, I think that first thing, eh, 10 years speaks uh, volumes about your loyalty. It speaks volumes. You know, back in the early days of CAP, there was, here in uh, New Zealand, there was a real pioneering attitude. Uh, I've heard some stories about the first CAP staff conference, and if I know Alistair, if I know Amy, if I know a couple of others who were there, it was a bit mischievous, uh, so I hear. 
Um, but you need, you need people who can take it forward from there. You need people who are loyal. You need people who are committed. You need people who can take it to the next level. And this is what we've seen in Alistair. And I want to say a huge thank you for that, Alistair. I've known Alistair for about six and a half years now. And um, Alistair, I've really thoroughly enjoyed and appreciated some of our chats, some of our conversations. You know, often we'll be at, the, at a CAP conference and at the end of a session, there's Alistair there at the back and he's, uh, he's reflecting, he's chewing things over, he's uh, providing ideas which are innovative, uh, he's providing questions which are challenging, and he's always, always providing words which are encouraging. And Alistair, you're a huge encourager. And I thank you so much for your encouragement to me personally and to the wider captain. Wider than North Cape Baptist, uh, Alistair has been a huge asset to the national work of CAP. And uh, through his connections, he's introduced church leaders to CAP who are now running successful CAP ministries in their own churches. Uh, he's introduced people who have the capacity to give significant funds uh, to sustain the work. And so again, thank you, Alan, for, uh, Alistair, for your vision there and for your networking there. Here at Northcote Baptist, uh, Alistair, I believe Alistair kicked off Monday Muffins, the famous Monday Muffins. This is back in the day prior to release groups, prior to life skills and so on. An opportunity for cat families to, to come together, to enjoy getting to know one another, uh, learning more about God. I came up here to Monday Muffins once and just had a wonderful, wonderful time. And Monday Muffins originated here at Northcote Baptist. But again, it's been a concept that's been adopted by other CAP partner churches across the country. So again, a real credit to you and your vision there, Alistair. I also want to um, just acknowledge as well, something else I admire about you, Alistair, is your humility. Because I think the way that you've handed over to Trish, uh, to Jay, obviously with Jane and Colin in the mix as well, really speaks to your humility. You've never thought that you are bigger than this cat ministry or that this whole cat ministry is all about you. And I think in terms of releasing and empowering others, uh, your desire to do that really speaks volumes about your humility. So I just want to say well done on that as well. Alistair and Cap Head Office uh, see eye to eye on most things. We're, we're dedicated to providing uh, an excellent uh, professional service uh, to those in need, to be generous, to show the love of Jesus. Perhaps where there's a slight difference is that head office are working with about five or 600 uh, families at any one time. And so there's a real need, of course, to want to apply uh, consistent uh, principles, consistent policies, treat everyone in that manner. For Alistair, the one family that he's working with at that time are the most important family on earth, beyond his own, of course, and rightly so. So there's been a little bit of bending of the rules, some robust discussion, some healthy conflict, you could say. Not the Alistair you know, is it? <laughs> Surely not. And so, Alistair, what really uh, stands out for me in that, the real attitude you've taken into that, is your compassion. You have a huge heart for those in need to get alongside, to put an arm around their shoulder. You know, there are people here today who have benefited directly from that. People you have served, people you've invited into a relationship with Jesus. And we praise God for that. And so I want to share a verse. And interestingly, I'm going to share a verse from uh, Proverbs 31, which has all got you going, oh, crikey. And um, Bronwyn, I didn't actually realize you were going to be up the front here today. Um, but it's kind of apt in terms of this verse, because you're thinking Proverbs 31. Verse 10, well, here we go. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her. Wow, that's awesome. The thing is, uh, for anyone involved in a cat ministry, uh, there, is, there is sacrifices that a spouse makes um, because Alistair has been required at times to you know, go the extra mile and I'm sure spend time outside of kind of normal or reasonable hours uh, for cat client families. And so thank you uh, for the sacrifices that you've made in that respect. Amazing. But I just want to go back uh, a, a couple of verses and Alistair, the verses immediately before that, verses eight and nine, and this really speaks to your compassion. This speaks to your desire to really look after the one and go after the one. Proverbs 38 and nine, uh, 31, eight and nine, speak up 
for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. And I know you are passionate about that. This is kingdom stuff. This is what growing the kingdom is about. This is you. This is your compassion. This is your heart for the poor and needy. And I just want to say a huge, huge thank you. And well done, brother. Uh, go well and bless you. Mother Lord bless you and keep you. Ben for sharing and thank you Reg for your insights into how things began um, and Alistair we've just got a little presentation it's a uh, Ponamu um, and uh, we'd like to present that to you um, just as a, a little thank you and it's a it's a toki and koru uh, a symbol of great strength and mana I'm not sure if it'll f <laughs> um, it can't we can adjust it but I think um, we just want to say uh, that you definitely have mana and um, not only in our church, but in the CAP um, community and in our in our wider community, and uh, so that that is a real uh, symbol of strength and and mana that we see in you. And Trish, could you uh, pr uh, just bring the flowers? We got Bronwyn, we got some uh, flowers just to say thank you. Uh, ben said it so well uh, to you in, in the words that he said, but we also want to say thank you to both of you for your uh, support, and we know that. Alistair keeps reminding me that he's not retiring. Uh, he's, he's stepping down from leadership of CAP, but he's not retiring. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so he still wants to be involved. He's still, he's still got some uh, plenty of energy left or some energy left to, to contribute, and I know Bronwyn has too. So um, thank you both guys. And I know that Alistair, you'd like to say a few words, so let me pass you the microphone. Thank you. Some ways I didn't want this, and yet some ways I think it's great to do it because it tells of the work that CAP has. I want to thank all you who have come today, especially the CAP team from head office, uh, one special person down the back who's come, um, and some other special people a bit further down the front that I recognise, and a few others. So thank you for coming. Um, it's wonderful. You know. Um, Part of the reason I'm sitting down and not standing up is because I've been on crutches all my life and Reg mentioned that. But the other one is because I've broken my leg and that just makes it a little bit harder. And so it's funny that when I was thinking about this today, the verse that came to my mind was uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And it's not usual that I come across a thinking that my feet are beautiful. <laughs> it's been a privilege to take that good news of debt relief but even more important, of God's love and God's salvation to our community. I want to thank God that he's allowed us to be his ambassadors of Jesus Christ and of Northcote Baptist Church to the community. But I think the thing to understand is this is not an individual role. It's not even a cap role. It requires a... well. Certain um, Prime Minister talks about a team of five million, not quite that amount, but it requires that everyone, it requires a team comprising all of us. So I want to thank the whole team. And the whole team is not just the people who work in the CAP ministry here in Northcote, not just the people who work in the CAP ministry and head office, but also everyone who has given, who has prayed, has encouraged has helped in so, so many ways. And I want to be grateful that I've been able to pass that ministry across to Trish um, to take the leadership. I can, I can assure you, it's a little bit of push me, pull me. Um, Trish would say, I, I'm ready, I'm not ready. I'd think about it and say, I'm ready, I'm not ready. <laughs> But finally, we did make the decision to do that. But it isn't a fair well. If you actually look at your newsletter, I'm booked in to do a CAP money course. Um, so anyone who wants to uh, come along to that CAP money course, feel free. The other thing I do want to make a minor correction on Reg is a uh, very good speech. What he didn't know is guess who told Rick, um, Morris about it. 
<laughs> Morris and I were involved in that rather difficult interview with, uh, with Cap to test them out before we made our commitment. What I'd like to do is encourage each and every one of us to continue the work. So those that have gave, continue giving. And all the rest of us that we might give, pray, help, encourage as you are able. This isn't a good work. We all talk about good works. This is a great work of God. The local church offers us, uh, sorry, it is a work where, and what really got me going from that first day Cap came to New Zealand just about, was an aha moment where it was all about the local church, but it was all about helping people, but it was also all about sharing the gift the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what made it so precious. I've been around our churches for many, many years, and sometimes we get the gospel right, and sometimes we get the helping right, and sometimes we get the local church right, but very seldom do we get all three right. And I think that one of the wonderful things about the cat ministry is getting all three things right. But I do want to make a couple of special thanks, and the first one is to my darling wife. Now, she said, I don't want to be up the front, I've done nothing. <laughs> and yet I would say she's done everything. And because she's done everything, I have been able to do some things. I do want to thank one or two others who kept me sane along the way, Bronwyn Babbage, who was here for a while and helped me in the ministry for quite a while. Um, she did two very good things. She kept me sane, <laughs> very hard to do. But also she introduced us to Trish, who said there was this woman who was caring for the community and you should meet her. And Trish and I then started a long conversation, which has led her to the point where she is the cap manager here at Northgate. So Trish, thank you for taking on the job, but also thank you for being part of that encouragement. Um, and Kath, um, for so many years you've been doing muffins. You weren't the first, but you've been doing it for so many years. And um, it's great to be able to take uh, someone along and taking someone who uh, needs love, needs encouragement, sometimes broken, and say, Kath, join us with us and share your love and share the love of this church with them. So that's it. Thank you. But in saying thank you, may I also make it a call for all of you who have been involved to continue the work and for any of you who are not involved to become part of the work. Thank you. Kath is going to come in and lead us in prayer. I, I think, uh, as Alistair and Bronwyn, you, I, I know you, you can't make it down the stairs, you're going to make it out that way. But I think we should just stand and give them, a, just honour them with another round of applause to say thanks. Kia ora uh, You can sit down now if you like. Um, I'm actually going to really miss how he's going. Alistair, um, I'm one of the leaders at Muffins that you heard about before, and uh, sometimes we get some uh, tricky questions coming our way, and oh, fair enough too, one, about reason. God. And, um, and I would I would look at the, uh, the person that was saying it, i go, that's a really good question. Let's see what Alistair has to say about that. All right, um, just going to do some pastoral prayer soon and we'll join that uh, together in praying. Um, as much as we were privileged to have church at home, it is good to be back together. We may have walked in the doors today with joy in our heart, feeling close to God with a sense of purpose, or we may be feeling a little overwhelmed, a little lost and not so sure where God is. And does he really have everything in control, under control? The good news is you came anyway. The good news is that Jesus walked in with you. The good news is, is that as we pray together now, we can experience the Holy Spirit 
lifting our spirit as we worship God together. No matter your feelings, God wants you to worship him. As we join now in corporate prayer, whether you pray aloud or quietly, let's be reminded that God is amongst us and he hears our prayers and he is willing to answer them according to his will. Let's pray now together. Hand this time, if you want to share anything or pray, let's do that now. Let's do it together. Lord, thank you for CAP. Thank you for all the families it has connected with. Thank you for all the hard work Alistair has put into it over the past 10 years. And thank you for Bronwyn and all her sacrifice and support she has given to. Bless them both in the next stage of their lives. Father, today we also specifically pray for people in our church that face an un- unemployment. We boldly come to you asking that employment be found quickly We pray for miracles in the coming weeks for these people. Encourage them, Lord, immensely. Thank you for being with our missionaries, both overseas and those that have returned to New Zealand because of COVID. May your hand of protection be over those still in countries that have high levels of COVID. Give them wisdom as to know how to go about their day. May you watch over Susie as she starts the journey back to New Zealand soon. And for those that are back in New Zealand, we pray that they can use their gifts in ways that further your kingdom. Father, we have people that are either sick, people with injuries, people that need surgery, people that people are terminally ill. We know you are with them. May they be uplifted by your peace, comfort them in their pain that they may be experiencing. Provide good medical support and let them know that your God and church loves them and cares for them. Father, we ask that you will guide our government, give them wisdom and discernment in these difficult times. May you prompt them to make godly decisions for this country. May you be with governments all around the world. May wars be prevented, may kindness be shown and positive changes be made. God, we see a world struggling and fighting and in many cases not coping with COVID and we can feel helpless. Lord, let us not forget to pray for them. We know we live in a broken world, but we do not have a broken God. We ask that your power is released into the world like never before and that evil has its circulation cut off at its roots. Lord, we thank you for the tithes and offerings given today, and it is good to know we are a giving church, and in your eyes it's not the amount given, but more the attitude in which we give. 
May we remember that when we give, we are giving so that the good news of Jesus Christ can spread throughout our country and into this world. With all the changes going on right now, let us focus on the things that never change, the unchangeable truths, God's love, God's power, and God's promises. We love you, Lord. May you go out and show that love to others this, this week. In Jesus' name, amen. It's Kath. I wonder if any of you can recall the best sermon that you ever heard. Can you recall the best sermon you ever heard? Maybe I should ask if any of you can recall any sermon you've ever heard. Ever thought about how many sermons you've listened to in your lifetime? For some of you, maybe you've listened to 50 sermons, or maybe some of you, you've heard 100 sermons. Some of you might have heard 500 sermons. Some of you might have heard over 1,000 sermons. Maybe today is your very first one. As you think back over all the sermons that you've heard, whether it's many or just a few, I wonder how many of those sermons really stood out. I wonder how many of them were truly memorable. I wonder how many of those sermons had a profound impact on your life. How many of those sermons completely changed your life, changed your attitude, changed your worldview, changed your relationships, changed your behavior? Probably there aren't very many of them. Perhaps there haven't been any. And maybe even the ones you thought at the time were outstanding, you don't remember much, if anything, about them now. I added up the number of times that I've preached here at Northcote Baptist Church. And I figure I've preached more than 100 times here in the last two and a half years. I wonder if anyone remembers any of them. Over my 32 years of ministry, I've figured out that I've preached well over 1,500 uh, times. 1,500 sermons, that's a lot, isn't it? Makes you tired thinking about it. <laughs> this morning and for the next eight weeks, we are looking at a sermon that was preached 2,000 years ago. As we continue in our series, Hashtag Blessed, this sermon has been described as the greatest sermon in history, the greatest sermon ever preached. Uh, see, have we got our PowerPoint working now? Uh, it's excellent. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up here. I can't seem to pick it up, so if you guys can control the uh, PowerPoints, it will be helpful for me. Thanks. The greatest sermon ever preached. I was going to use that as my title this morning, but it might have confused you. You might have thought that my sermon was the greatest sermon ever preached. But no, we're looking at the greatest sermon ever preached, the sermon that was preached 2,000 years ago. The lives of the thousands who heard it on that day, it was preached, and the countless millions who have read it since then have been changed. The greatest sermon ever preached literally changed the course of history. And do you know what the very first word of this greatest sermon ever preached was? What was the very first word in this greatest sermon ever preached? It was the word blessed. That's right. Hashtag blessed. Oh, no hashtag. Sorry, just blessed. <laughs> Didn't have hashtags 2,000 years ago. For the first part of the series that we've been doing, hashtag blessed, we've been looking at the Psalms and looking at what the Bible in the Old Testament tells us about what it means to be blessed. And last week, uh, if you're here, you'll remember we talked about that Psalm 126 that finishes with that wonderful phrase, armloads of blessing. Don't you love that? Armloads of blessing. But now we come to the second part of the series, and we're looking at what Jesus says about being blessed. This greatest sermon ever preached begins with this word. And it's found in Matthew's gospel, and the preacher of that greatest sermon was Jesus, of course. And Matthew says at the end of the sermon, Matthew's making a commentary on the sermon, and he says at the end of the sermon, when Jesus finished preaching, the people were astonished. They were amazed. And Matthew says that as a result of this sermon, great multitudes followed him. 
and they worshipped him, and they were willing to follow him anywhere. Such was the power of this sermon. What an incredible sermon that people were astonished, they were amazed, and there were millions, of, uh, not millions, but thousands of people uh, began to follow him at that time. So what was it that made this such an outstanding sermon? George Burns once famously said, the secret of a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending, and then having the two as close together as possible. (laughs) Well, Jesus has a stunning beginning. He starts out with this word, blessed. And he doesn't just say it once. He says it nine times in his introduction to the sermon, blessed, blessed, blessed. Over and over and over again, he talks about being blessed. We know these sayings or these statements as the Beatitudes. And for the next eight weeks, we're going to look at each of these blessed statements, these Beatitudes. Who are the blessed? And what does it look like to be blessed? And we might just be surprised what it looks like to to be blessed. So we find this sermon in in Matthew chapter 5 and 6. But before Matthew gets to the sermon itself, in the first four chapters of his gospel, Matthew introduces us to Jesus. Before he tells us about Jesus' sermon, he tells us about Jesus. If you remember, if you know anything about Matthew's gospel, you know that the opening chapter in Matthew's gospel is a genealogy. It tells us where Jesus came from. His, his family tree. And then Matthew goes on to tell us about Jesus' birth and his baptism and his temptations in the wilderness. And he introduces us to Jesus' ministry. He tells us about this new preacher who's come to town and how this preacher was uh, announcing something extraordinary. Everywhere he traveled, this new preacher, Jesus, was announcing a new kingdom. Repent, he was saying, for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God has come near. And things started happening. Matthew tells us about it. People were being cured of diseases. People who had long suffered blindness were beginning to see again. Lame were beginning to walk. People long held captive by demonic activity were being set free. All these things were going on from this man, Jesus. And Matthew is telling us in these opening chapters, before he tells us about what Jesus is saying, he tell, he's telling us about who Jesus is. And in the space of these, these four opening chapters, you can see it on the screen, Matthew has described Jesus in all these different ways. He said that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of David. He's the son of Abraham. He's talk, he talks about Jesus being God saves, God with us, Emmanuel, Holy Spirit baptizer, shepherd, the Father's deep, deep, uh, dearly loved and deeply pleasing son. He's the light of the world. All of these things, uh, Matthew's telling us about who Jesus is. All of this before Jesus even opens his mouth to teach. All of this leading up to this greatest sermon. Matthew's introducing and building up this man, Jesus, so that we can hardly wait to hear what he's got to say. If he's all of those things that Matthew's describing, we need to listen to him. See, what Matthew's doing is telling us that who Jesus is, is the key to understanding what he teaches. See, without Jesus, it's impossible to fully understand, let alone live by the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you hear a lot of people say, well, I'm not necessarily a Christian. I'm not a Christian, but I try and live by the Sermon on the Mount. Hear people say that? But it seems that Matthew's going to great lengths to uh, to tell us about who Jesus is before he tells us what Jesus teaches. John Stott, a British uh, pastor or teacher, said, The Sermon on the Mount is arguably the best known but least practiced part of Jesus' teachings. Nearly everyone's heard of of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says even non-Christian people say they admire it and try and live by it. So I strongly suggest they've never read it. Think about that for a moment. From all over Galilee, people 
flock to hear this preacher. Let's listen to uh, the opening introduction to his sermon from Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That was the opening, the introduction, the introductory remarks in Jesus' sermon. So what are these blessed statements all about? You know, you can find these Beatitudes all over the place. These words, these Beatitudes, they're on posters, they're on greeting cards, they hang on walls. Some of you might have even done a cross-stitch with some of those uh, Beatitudes. Anyone done an embroidery, a cross-stitch with a Beatitude? There's some on the screen. Oh, there will be, there's some there on the screen. You can show those on the screen. They're everywhere. People um, love having these kind of pithy sayings, beautiful proverbs on their walls or on greeting cards. People use hashtag Beatitude. Can you believe that? Hashtag Beatitude on Instagram. You can search on it, and there are thousands of posts with hashtag Beatitude on them. And they seem like very wise sayings, don't they? The poor the meek, the, the peacemakers, the mourners, all these different groups of people um, have these nice proverbs about them. They all sound very wise and, and beautiful, and they sure look nice on a greeting card or on, on a plaque on the wall, but what do they really mean? What are they really about? Well, Before we look at these Beatitudes, I want you to notice something about them with me. Notice how they're packaged. Notice verse 1. Uh, sorry, it's actually verse 3, I think, but it's the opening beatitude and the final one, the, the first beatitude and the last one. Notice how they both finish in the same way. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the final one, blessed are those who are persecuted because of their righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is bookending or bracketing his eight blessed statements by this phrase, the kingdom of heaven. See, what Jesus is describing here in these eight different kinds of people, or in fact, they're not eight different kinds of people. These are all qualities and characteristics of all people who are in the kingdom of God. These are the characteristics of one group of people. These are all characteristics of of people who are in the kingdom. These are all characteristics of people who are Christians, Christ followers, followers of Jesus. Jesus is describing this new kingdom. He's describing what this new order is all about. It's all about being comforted, inheriting the earth, about receiving mercy, about seeing God. Perhaps that's the greatest blessing of all, isn't it? Seeing God. It's about being called and treated as, uh, as children of God. See, it's a package deal, all wrapped up in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, this is what kingdom people look like. These eight qualities in the Beatitudes will characterize people in, in God's kingdom. Kingdom people are poor in spirit. They're meek. They're merciful. They're pure in heart. In fact, each beatitude builds on the one before. So the poor in spirit are also meek. The meek are also pure in heart. The pure in heart are merciful. The merciful are, are hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you see, one beatitude flows on to the next and to the next. Being poor in spirit results in mourning over the sinful condition of my heart. Mourning gives birth to meekness, to gentleness, Gentleness creates this hunger for righteousness, which in turn produces a merciful heart, 
which results in a pure heart. See how they build one after the other. You know, many times people hear or read these Beatitudes and they think this is a list of attitudes that they have to try and implement into their lives. You know, I guess I'm supposed to try harder. And you're probably thinking, Bruce, that's what, that's, that's what I'm going to say this morning. You've got to try harder to be meek. You've got to try harder to, to be merciful. You've got to try harder to be pure in heart. In fact, sometimes these Beatitudes are taught as be attitudes as if there are attitudes that somehow we have to create in our lives. We have to try and, and make happen in our lives. And sometimes, even though these Beatitudes say blessed, when we read them, we end up feeling the total opposite. We feel guilty. We feel, I can never be like that. I, I, I just feel defeated because I, I don't have a strong sense of mercy. I don't feel like I'm a pure in heart. And, and, and when we read these, they're not blessed statements for us at all. We feel guilty, we feel down, we feel like we haven't achieved those things. So we need to understand that Jesus in these Beatitudes is not talking about what we have to do or what we have to be in order to be blessed. He is not saying we've got to try harder to be poor in spirit or try to become more meek. He's not saying we have to work hard at being a peacemaker. He's not saying work at hungering for righteousness. He is not saying cultivate these attitudes in your life and then you'll be blessed. He's doing something very different. See, these Beatitudes, these blessed statements are not about what we have to do. It's not about us. It's not about our actions, but they're what God is doing in us. They're talking about what people in this new kingdom, this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven, are. uh, 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 what, what people look like as God works in them. People in this new kingdom will be marked by being poor in spirit. People in this new kingdom will be meek. They'll be hungering for righteousness. They'll be merciful. They'll be pure in heart. They'll be peacemakers. These are all consequences of us embracing God's rule and reign in our lives. Jesus says these people in this kingdom are blessed. We'll look more at this word as we go on in the series, but sometimes this word is translated happy. In fact, one book on my shelf about the Beatitudes is called the Be Happy Attitudes. But there's a problem with the word happy. See, happy relates to circumstance. We could say happiness depends on happenings. And the problem is that most people uh, don't feel happy all the time. Anyone here always always feel happy? I thought not. Feelings of happiness come and go, don't they? Most of us probably feel happy some of the time. Uh, But happiness generally depends on things happening in our lives, good things happening in our lives. Whether you or I feel happy is not the point of this word that Jesus uses here. So happy is probably not the best word to use. In this word, blessed, that Jesus uses nine times, uh, he's declaring what God's attitude is, what God's assessment is of us. Another suggested word is the word congratulations. Congratulations to the poor in spirit. Congratulations to those who mourn. Congratulations to the meek. Or another suggested phrase is, you lucky people. You lucky people, poor in spirit. You lucky people who mourn. You lucky people who are meek. You lucky people who are merciful and pure in heart. Another suggested, suggested word is a very Kiwi word. Good on ya. And you've got to say it all good. You don't say good on you. You say good on ya. Good on you, you people. Good on you, you people who are poor in spirit. Good on you, you people who are merciful. You lucky people. Congratulations to the poor in spirit. Congratulations to the merciful, to the mourn, to those who mourn, to the meek. Good on you. God smiles on you. See, that's what it's like, friends, in this kingdom. 
That's what it's like in this kingdom because God blesses people in these ways. Jesus is describing a new kind of kingdom. And everything about this kingdom, when you first hear about it, sounds like an upside-down kingdom. Everything in this new kingdom seems to be turned on its head. A kingdom where the last are first. A kingdom where the poor are rich. A kingdom where the last, uh, a kingdom where slaves are free. A kingdom where people can have direct access to God Himself. It sounds like an upside down king, kingdom, doesn't it? Blessed are you who mourn. It sounds upside down. The qualities Jesus blesses only seem upside down because actually our old humanity is upside down. Jesus actually comes into our world and he turns everything up the right way again. When Jesus invites us into his kingdom, he's actually inviting us to the right side up kingdom. He's setting everything right again. And so my question to you this morning, Are you a right-side-up person? Are you a kingdom person? Are you a follower of Jesus? If you are, friends, you know what you are? You're blessed. Congratulations. You lucky people who are in the kingdom. You right-side-up people. Good on you because God is blessing you. Because in this new kingdom, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him. In this new kingdom, God blesses those who mourn, and they will be comforted. In this new kingdom, God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. In this new kingdom, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, and they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, and they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. And God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Do you want to be blessed? Be part of God's kingdom, and you will know those blessings. Those characteristics will become part of your life as well. Good on you, God, for blessing us. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this uh, amazing introduction to this greatest sermon ever preached that contains all of these blessed statements. God, we thank you that that Jesus is telling us what life is like in this kingdom. Lord, we want to know uh, what it's like to be blessed in our lives. We want to be part of this uh, right side up kingdom. We want to be part of this kingdom where everything is set right. This kingdom where people are blessed. Blessed uh, with mercy. Blessed with comfort. Blessed with Uh, uh, pure hearts, blessed by being able to see God, blessed by being called children of God. Lord, we want to know those blessings in our lives. God, I pray again this morning that as we walk in your ways, as we follow you, as we follow who you are, that we might know these blessings, that we might know that genuine sense of happiness that doesn't come out of circumstances, but comes because we work We walk with the one who provides these blessings. God, walk with us this week, I pray. May we know your presence with us. Lord, may you bless us and keep us. And may you make your face shine on us again. May you be gracious to us. May you turn your face toward us and give us peace. May we know your blessing in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing that song this morning. We uh, had it a few weeks ago on our NBC at Home page. Uh, This new song, it's called The Blessing. It only just got written a couple of months ago, and it's kind of taken the world by storm. Churches all over the world have been doing this song, and you've seen probably on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, uh, large groups of people singing it. And uh, so our group's going to 
uh, give it a go singing it this morning. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, blessing from Numbers 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. Let's stand together and sing it and ask for God's blessing on us.
may you smile your smile of blessing upon us. Lord, may you bless us and keep us and make your face to shine upon us. Lord, may you be gracious to us. May you turn your face toward us and smile on us again and give us your peace. May we know your blessing upon our lives and upon the lives of our family and our family's family and, Lord, to a thousand generations. Smile your smile of favor upon us, those of us who are in your kingdom, this right side up kingdom. Lord, may we be blessed people. May we be blessed to be a blessing. Not blessed just for ourselves, but blessed to be a blessing. And Lord, as we go out from this place this morning, may we know your smile of blessing upon us. May we go out to be blessed, to be a blessing to others through this week. May your grace and your mercy and your presence be with us all. Now, and until we meet again. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Just a reminder that we have prayer up the front. If you'd like some prayer this morning, please come up. We'll have someone to pray with you. Please stay around for tea and coffee after the service.